Welcome back to a video lecture on implementation of conservation plans. This video ends our series and our like video lecture part of this course. And I thought that it really would be a good time for me to tell you a bit about my own work and especially in my work related to spatial conservation planning. So I have been working with traditional rural biotopes or different kinds of meadows and wood pastures for a while. And these habitats really provide us a very concrete example on how hard effective conservation planning can be. And in this video I will outline the many values traditional rural biotopes host and I will explain why they are in dire need of spatial targeting of conservation management. And I have done one such a prioritization analysis and I will explain that case study in more detail. I will use the best practices defined in the previous lecture. Um, those best practices of conservation planning give us a tool to evaluate the successful parts of our case study and also those parts that would have required some refinement. Yeah, and this video also works as a summary of many of those topics that we have dealt throughout this course and in these videos. And I hope you enjoy. And sorry about my bad hair day. So today's topic is conservation of traditional rural biotopes or TRBs for short. And I will be talking about the Finnish context. And this is my own research topic. So I wanted this lecture to be a bit more discussive. Uh, TRBs are habitats that need constant or active management in order to persist. These habitats include meadows, different kinds of meadows and wood pastures. And they are formed through traditional agricultural practices that are related to animal husbandry. So the grazing of meadows and wood pastures have, have been done by domestic grazers, such as cows and horses and sheep and such. Uh, the meadow habitats also have been mown by people in order to get wind fodder to the animals on those farms. TRBs are quite specific in their ecology. They have a high species richness and they also have a high beta diversity. That means the heterogeneity of habitats in space. And they are also very threatened because of the agricultural modernization in, in the 1950s and after that, TRBs have been largely vanished from Finland and also from other countries in Europe. The biodiversity and, and the intricate ecological functions of TRB habitats go back to the time of of large scale grasslands that existed in Europe in, in the last ice age and, and also before and after that. So all the species are of a natural origin and also the ecological interactions, for example, very complex species interactions, um, like mutualistic interactions and, and competitive interactions are 100% of a natural origin. So these habitats can be seen as remnants of, of those gone by grasslands that once existed here. And also other disturbance habitats such as, as flooding meadows and other frequently ecologically disturbed habitats have species that are common on traditional rural biotopes also. So traditional rural biotopes are sort of like a remnant habitat and, and they provide a 
last fortress for some of those species that are really threatened. So traditional rural biotopes needs, need management actions in order to persist and in order to sustain the biodiversity and the conservation and value that they have. And this makes them a hot potato in, in the field of Finnish nature conservation. So conservation of GRBs has been mentioned as one of the most difficult issues in the field of nature conservation in Finland. Because they cannot be conserved by setting aside areas, they need to be actively managed in order to retain their conservation value. And when I started my PhD project back in the year 2013, I conceptualized my study subject like this. I started with the history and heritage related to traditional rural biotopes. So they are rooted in old fashioned agricultural practices that were conducted on small family farms. They are dependent on extensive grazing that is not intensive in, in terms of how many animals there are per area unit. Also mowing was very widespread in those times. And pollarding of trees was also one method of collecting winter fodder for the animals. And these land use practices formed these complex landscapes that hosted both people and domestic animals and, and natural biodiversity. Then there are also other values related to GRBs. Of course, this old fashioned agriculture is related to much of our national cultural history and tradition, but there are also important ecosystem services related to them. GRBs can provide economic benefits for contemporary farmers also, although the contemporary farming is not based on usage of TRBs anymore, as it used to be for hundreds of years before the agricultural modernization. Uh, management of TRBs creates aesthetic landscapes that people value a lot. And in the biodiversity perspective, there is, is species richness and environmental heterogeneity, as I already explained, but there is also important genetic diversity related to, to these last remaining populations of species. The truth is that TRBs are facing a crisis at the moment, and that crisis is caused by agricultural modernization, as I mentioned. It has led to a significant habitat loss, so that now there is less than 1% left of TRBs when compared to a situation 100 or 150 years ago. So in Finland, we have maybe 45,000 hectares left. This has led to a situation where 93% of TRB habitats are classified as endangered or threatened. And from the whole species pool of Finland, 22% uh, of those species classified as threatened in the national red list, those species are TRB species. So they are a very important habitat type for threatened species in Finland. And agricultural modernization has also affected to habitat quality in a bad way. So many of the remaining TRB habitats are in poor shape. They have faced quality deterioration. What can be done then? Well, <clears throat> TRB habitats have been acknowledged to be important both nationally and, and on international level. And the European Union has developed many projects and agri-environmental schemes that aim to um, improve the situation of TRB habitats. 
There is also a management consultation that can be used for TRB sites. And of course, one action that has not been much utilized yet is the prioritization of TRB management. These actions uh, are effective if they work and, and if people are willing to take on to them. But many of the EU funded projects and, and also the agri-environmental schemes are, are partly EU funded. They are seen as very bureaucratic and because this is national subsidies based for management, um, these management sites and the contracts for management need to be inspected. And this may be a hindrance for management actions also. But in my work, I studied the TRB site management prioritization because it was an action that hasn't been utilized that much in, in Finland. And now I want to come a bit back to this slide. So I ended the first part of this lecture with this slide and, and then I explained how there often is a trade-off between the time resource, so in which time the conservation plan should be done, and the depth of stakeholder collaboration. And I explained that the reason behind this trade-off is that building true collaboration and, and trust among people, it really takes time. And at the same time, many conservation issues should be solved rapidly. And now I want to turn this a bit around and speak a bit more about resources. So another and maybe even more restrict, restricting factor is actually the monetary resource of conservation projects. If we had ample funding, more people could be hired to the projects and this could alleviate the trade off between time and level of collaboration, as then we would have more people doing the outreach work, which is essential to uh, get stakeholders informed, involved and empowered. And now in the context of TRB conservation, the monetary resource is really a key factor. And it is a key factor also for other habitats that require active management for persistence. So in Finland, Agri-environmental subsidies or payments are paid for those farmers who manage meadows and woodbusters. And this is a totally different situation when compared to set aside protection, where a reserve is established and a one-time payment is done on that occasion. So now with TRB habitats, resources are needed every year to ensure the continuance and profitability of conservation management. At least this is the current situation. And then if the management funding ends or runs out, it risks that many TRB sites become abandoned. They are not managed anymore. And this means that the species communities on those sites start to change through ecological succession. And habitat quality gets worse for the grassland species, which are among the most threatened species in Finland. And eventually the species become locally extinct and the meadow and wood pasture habitats transform into forests and other habitat types. And thus the TRB habitats are you know, also threatened by extinction. This means that the ecological nature of TRBs is very challenging for conservation and it would be very important to be able to target the available management resources in the best possible way. So in this iterative uh, process of conservation planning, in TRBs case, the only functional option is to uh, aim high. So we really need conservation activities that are related to management action that aim to persistence of biodiversity 
um, that are based on stakeholder collaboration that is, is very tight and, and deep and which has a long term time scale. And how to get there with these very scarce resources that we have at hand. Now we come to the need of targeting the management effort and targeting the resources spatially in the landscapes with spatial prioritization. So here is the question I aim to answer with the zonation analysis I made for my research project. So I asked where management of traditional rural biotopes should be spatially allocated to in order to build a network of managed traditional rural biotopes that aims for securing the persistence of threatened species and habitat types that are dependent on management actions. So here are a few things that I want to highlight and emphasize. So first of all, uh, this study dealt with spatial, um, spatial allocation of management and it aimed to build networks of sites because TRBs are so few and so fragmented. So in order to support the species populations, it is very important to emphasize the connectedness among the management site network. And here um, it is assumed that the increased connectivity among the sites uh, secures the persistence of, of species populations and also supports uh, the existent um, the continued existence of, of those habitat types because if we have multiple sites that are located quite near each other they can be managed as a whole so maybe one farmer is more willing to take charge of management of, of a few um, larger sites that are located quite near each other because then he can circulate the same domestic animals from one site to another within one grazing season. Okay, let's proceed and explore this case study example according to Knight and colleagues list of best practices of conservation planning. And the first good practice was to identify the key stakeholders who really want the assessment to be done and to identify the conservation related needs that have to be met. And in this case study, a key stakeholder was the Finnish government or governmental institutions. There has been a stated national target of 60,000 managed TRB hectares that has been repeated since year 2000 and it has proved to be very difficult to reach that number. And here the key institutions are of course Ministry of the Environment who has been giving this target. Then Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry is the uh, institution that is in charge of the agri-environmental payments that are used to fund TRB management. Then we have Parks and Wildlife Finland or Metsähallitus Luontopalvelut as previously was said in Finland. Um, and Parks and Wildlife Finland is an important stakeholder in that sense that they govern the state-owned lands in Finland and thus they are the largest landowner of TRBs in Finland. Also Finnish Environmental Institute is an important stakeholder. And then regional ELU centers or centers for uh, economic development, uh, transportation and the environment. And these ELU centers are in charge of making the contracts for the management subsidies and management payments. So they are an important uh, organization in that sense. But then we also have other stakeholders. We have private landowners and, and especially cattle farmers who of course have their own interests in 
the realm of TRB management. So private landowners are interested in landscape management. Often this is the case. And they value the cultural heritage related to TRBs, but also the biodiversity values. And for cattle farmers who typically are the people who manage TRBs, they value the income that they can get out of TRB management and they can in some cases tie TRB management into their livelihoods. For example, if they um, are involved in rural tourism business, uh, they can, for example, rent cabins that are located near TRBs or indeed within TRB landscapes, and that can be highly attractive uh, for tourists and, and directly affects positively the livelihood of the rural entrepreneur. And in, in our case, um, our collaboration was largely based on on the governmental side and i will come back to this a bit later but let's say that that this first part was the most important one in in this case study then the second good practice of conservation planning was to situate spatial prioritization techniques within a broader implementation model and this was very important in this project and actually because we started with no proper data at hand we had to start with digging out where TRBs are and we had some kind of an understanding of of the private land side because there had been a national survey done in in the 1990s although that data was outdated but we had to trust it but we did not have that good information from the state owned land. So this project actually started with GIS based um, desk studies that explored where the abandoned and managed and potential TRB sites are located on state owned lands, including protected areas and also those state lands that are not protected. And these um, pre-studies gave us an opportunity to develop a national level GIS database that consisted information on surveyed TRBs, both on private land and, both and on state-owned land. And then we had data on protected TRBs, which also can be located on privately owned land or state owned land. Then we had information, spatial information, spatial data on TRBs that are managed through agri-environmental payment contracts. And we also had information on occurrences of TRB specialist species, especially the red listed or threatened ones. And Based on this data, I conducted a zonation prioritization, and this study was published in 2017. And here in, in this zonation prioritization, the model of conservation value was purposefully restricted to ecological attributes. So this was because this study was tailored for parks and wildlife Finland's purposes and and it was important for them to get the ecological information out of this study and after that when we get the, like the base knowledge of of the ecological importance of the sites that are located in in state-owned land after that they could more easily be starting to include the social aspects into the project. All right, the analytical process of the spatial prioritization was as follows. So because we had so little spatial knowledge to begin with, we really had to start with finding out the current management situation. 
So this first analysis helped us to describe what kinds of TRBs were managed and where the managed sites were located. So we started with, with the very basic analysis on current management situation. And this was done in ArcGIS and it was based on vector data that we had in, in our uh, national GIS database. And we did a very simple overlay and union analysis where we compared the spatial coverage of surveyed TRBs and protected TRBs with the coverage of agri-environmental scheme subsidy contracts. And from this uh, analysis, we got out the information on where we have TRB sites that are both surveyed and managed. <clears throat> and where we have TRB sites that are both protected and managed. And then with this information, we were able to proceed. And the second analysis that we did um, was based on the question, which TRB should be managed and where? So first we found out where we have currently managed TRBs and what kind of TRBs they are. And now we started to develop scenarios on, on where that management actually should occur. So the second analysis was, was basically a scenario analysis. And it proceeded <clears throat> with this usual zonation data handling procedure. So we had to uh, rasterize the data and, and select the data set that we wanted to base the prioritization on and develop the input features out of it. And then we ended up with, with raster data that con contained information on TRB habitats and specialist species occurrences. And we assigned weights to those raster layers. And then we incorporated this data into a zonation analysis, which was first done without any connectivity considerations. And then for comparison, we also run to another to other zonation prioritizations, which were done with interaction connectivity. So we wanted to emphasize the connectedness of, of potential TRB sites into the network of surveyed TRBs, because uh, those survey TRBs are sites where people have been doing field surveys on. So we know which species occur there and we know how valuable they are in terms of conservation. So we wanted to emphasize those survey TRBs and then we wanted to uh, know those sites that would best uh, complement the network of survey TRBs. And we run this interaction connectivity analysis with two dispersal kernels. Uh, the first was done with a two kilometer dispersal kernel and the second one was done with five kilometer dispersal kernel. So in the end, we had three zones and prioritizations and we had to choose which performed the best in terms of, of biodiversity. And we did a pairwise comparisons between the analysis in R. And we found out that the two kilometer interaction, interaction connectivity prioritization performed the best. And then we took the data back to ArcGIS and we developed generalized scenario maps out of the prioritization results. And they looked like this. So we had a total of, of four management scenarios and the first one this a map here it actually represents the network of survey trbs and then the b scenario tells us which are the most important sites that should be managed in addition to the network of a and then the c map also is like a stepwise addition to B and A, and so is the D. So you need to read these um, maps so that we begin with A, 
and then we add B, and then we add C, and finally we add D. And to say this in another way, so in words, so what we did, we uh, had the starting point that given the national goal of securing management of all valuable survey TRBs and increasing the total cover of managed TRBs to 60,000 hectares, which was the national goal. We then formulated a spatial prioritization solution for four nested management scenarios, where scenario A was the network of survey TRBs, and then B, C, and D were survey TRBs with a progressive addition of managed area. And, each, and in each of these consecutive scenarios, approximately um, 4,000 managed hectares were added in each step, thus forming a realistic stepwise plan for expansion of the management network. And the most extensive scenario, which was the scenario D, yielded a spatial allocation of nearly 45,000 hectares of managed TRBs. So we did not quite get to the national goal of 60,000 hectares, but we got to a good point if we think that achieving that 60,000 hectares really needs a long-term effort and, and thoughtful targeting of management action. All right, then what about the results? So we had the paper published, but what happened after that? Well, this was what we of course wished that would happen. So this is the graphical abstract of the paper. So the starting point is, is that the biodiversity dependent on low intensity grazing and mowing is rapidly vanishing in, in Finland. And our first result was that based on the data on, on the management status, um, we had a total of 19,200 hectares of TRBs that are managed through the agri-environmental subsidies. And on the other hand, we have approximately 30,300 hectares of TRBs that are surveyed as valuable. So we can see from those two maps that these spatial data sets do not quite overlap. So the management effort is not targeted to survey sites. And another observation was that the coastal region, so the Baltic Sea coast, emerges as a core area for both management effort and, and for the surveyed TRBs that we know that are biologically valuable. So we do need the spatial prioritization and spatial targeting of management actions. And if we were able to utilize the results of this analysis, we could achieve an ecologically targeted management network of um, 42,400 hectares. And this management network is, is based on the zonation prioritization. And what gains would we have if we were able to target management as, as such? We could get 6,900 threatened species occurrences safeguarded. All these species are dependent on management action. We would also have a representative habitat network because we incorporated multiple TRB habitat types into the analysis. And what we need, <laughs> what we would need in order to get to that goal, we would need a cost efficient allocation of management subsidies and an increase in current resources. Because we can see that current management is, is not um, targeted based on biodiversity values. It is based on other factors that are largely social. So we can say that uh, the conservation management of TRBs is, is not effective in Finland based on this study. But well, the, 
the next step would be to develop the operational model and it was very important in this project and it was published in 2018 so one year after the scientific article and this operational strategy <laughs> tavoitteet teoiksi uh, is targeted to state owned land and it emphasizes protected TRPs so sites located on protected areas so there is like some selections that were done at this phase and it is a nice publication that is available to read online All right, the third good practice was to involve experts and implementers in the spatial prioritization. And what did we do? So the spatial prioritization analysis was planned, conducted and reported by myself and Panu Halme in University of Jyväskylä. And then from Metsähallitus, Parks and Wildlife Finland, Maja Mussari and Katja Raatikainen were very much involved. So the four of us wrote the uh, paper. And I was the main workhorse in doing the prioritization. And then the initial results of the prioritization were presented to Perine Elo group, so the grassland group of the Finnish Board on Ecological Restoration, which is the expert panel on all things related to GRBs in Finland. And also, I also gave a presentation to Ministry of the Environment. And we got comments from a project group in Metsähallitus Parks and Wildlife Finland. And Mikko Kuussaari and Janne Heliölä from Finnish Environment Institute also commented on the study, which was very valuable. But as you can see, we are lacking the farmers and, and we are lacking the <laughs> non-governmental stakeholders here. So this is the part that would have needed most refinement, in my opinion. So if we had more time <laughs> and, and maybe a bit more resources in this project, it would have been a very good thing to have, for example, farmer representatives in the project group so that we could have gotten comments from them also. But luckily this is an ongoing effort uh, because TRB management is participatory by default. It needs collaboration among people. So it does not end when the paper was published, <laughs> but this uh, whole TRB conservation scheme, as to say, is, is an ever-developing one. It, it never gets finished. It is always evolving to some way or another. And, and the discussions are ongoing. Then I wanted to show you some results which are related to conservation opportunities. Uh, the fourth good practice of conservation planning was to identify conservation opportunities and not simply conservation priorities. So what gains do we have if we target TRB management according to the spatial prioritization? So here we have again our four scenarios. The first map here shows the network of survey TRBs. So this is the scenario A. And then when we add um, area to it according to scenario B, C and D, we get a map that looks like this. So here in, in this D scenario, we see a cumulative area of managed TRBs in each of these cells. And, and where there is red, there is a lot of area. And where there is blue, there is less area. And we can see that the coastline forms this kind of corridor of high quality TRPs where the management action especially could be targeted to. And then in, in these spider plots, we have the same scenarios A, B and C, and now they are uh, plotted in a ne nested way. So this most dark one, the innermost 
coverage relates to scenario A and then the second largest one is scenario B and then we have scenario C and, and the most broadest uh, coverage here is scenario D. And here we can see that um, this is the axis shows proportions of coverage that was included in the prioritization analysis. And here we can see that, for example, in terms of, of wooded pastures, that is Hakamat in Finnish. And it also, well, metzalitumet grazed woodlands are over there. So let's speak about wooded pastures now. So um, sites within the network of survey TRBs contained nearly half of all the wooded pastures in Finland and in our data sets. So if we were to target management according to scenario A, we could get managed nearly half of all wooded pastures. But if we extended that management network by the 400, uh, 4,000 hectares uh, that was added with scenario B, we could get a much higher representation of wooded pastures under management. And the same is of course true with scenario C and with scenario D, we could get almost all under management. Of course, there are wooded pastures that we did not have data on. So these graphs need to be interpreted with caution. But anyway, um, we can see that, that the targeting according to the management scenarios would be very, very beneficial in terms of, of conservation value, in terms of habitat conservation. And here in, in the lower panel, we have um, Natura 2000 habitats listed and the same pattern is true all, also here. So we get, get good conservation gains if we were able to target management as proposed. Then uh, what about the species? Well, here at the other side, we have graphs that show us uh, red listed species that were included in the analysis. So these are basically performance curves that are drawn for red list status categories. So the darkest solid line is for critically endangered species. Then we have uh, endangered species here and vulnerable species with the lighter dashed line and then the lightest solid line is for nearly threatened species. And we can see that when we expand the management network from A to B, we already get significant gains in terms of management of threatened species. Panel A shows us number of species and B shows us number of occurrences of the species. And yeah, bo both of these graphical outputs show us that, that the first step, uh, adding scenario B on top of scenario A is, is already very effective in ecological terms. But the situation would get even better if we could proceed according to scenario C and D. So, significant ecological benefits would be reached if the most valuable sites would be managed. And this would also mean more effective targeting of agri-environmental steam subsidies. Because those subsidies, those payments are targeted to protect biodiversity on, on agricultural land. So this is at the core of our analysis. And finally, we would have socioeconomic benefits for rural entrepreneurs. These are indirect, but they, they are possible because we could have um, like a consistent 
network of managed sites that are located quite near each other in the landscape. So the management could be more easily realized, practiced, and also the landscape would be more appealing to people because of the aesthetic values related to these habitats. Then the fifth good practice was to translate spatial prioritization outputs into planning products for end users. And now I wanted to show you a bit about the cartographical side of this study, because in communicating the results, the cartography drawing the maps is extremely important. And informative maps really take effort and time and, and thought to make. So this is the basic result figure that we draw. Here we have uh, um, on the upper row, we have the management scenarios in that form that A is the basic situation. So this is the network of survey TRBs and then B shows the 4000 hectares that, that should be added to A and then C is another set of 4000 additional management hectares and and so is D. And then there on the lower row, um, we have the distribution of currently managed TRBs. Then we have protected TRBs. So these are under some kind of, of a conservation decision. And then the G shows the distribution of TRB specialist vascular plant species occurrences. And all of these maps utilize the same legend. So it is shown here and here you can see how many hectares of managed TRBs or other variable there is within one cell. And the cell size is, is pretty coarse or pretty large in these maps for visual reasons. So we, we really wanted to pay attention to the way the maps were created. So for comparison, I will show you a map of, of one of our like starting point data sets or data layers. So this is a raw data that we utilized in the analysis before it was transformed into a raster format. So this is a vector format data and the map is derived straight from ArcGIS. So that is a very uninformative map. It, it roughly shows the spatial distribution of the data, but it does not have many, much other information in it. So we did not want to show these kinds of maps, but we wanted to show the generalized maps that are more informative and more easy to read. And we wanted to choose the scenario A as a starting point. And that is the survey TRB distribution. And then we wanted to show how scenario B would contribute to that and how scenario C would contribute to A and B and how scenario D would contribute to A, B and C. And finally, we wanted to represent also the distribution of managed TRBs in the same figure so that that distribution could be compared to that of, of the survey TRBs. And also the cumulative additional management shown by the three other scenarios. All right. Well, maps are very informative and maps can be interpreted in, in many ways. And, and this interpretation should have some flexibility in it. So our aim was not in any case to say that, that this is the way to go. TRB management has to be targeted in this way, but we wanted to feed the discussion on where TRB management should be done. So as Peter Verburg has said, rather than decision support tools, we should be talking about discussion support tools. And here, for example, is a photograph from, from Perine Elos uh, field trip. And, and we are in Åland, on Åland islands. And, and there we really discussed a lot about what is 
good TRP management and where TRPs need to be managed and how low is our knowledge on the current situation of TRP management and on, on the biodiversity values. This trip was made in 2016. And the discussions on that trip very much fed into the um, planning of, of this case study that I, I'm talking about here. And of course, our case study and its results were again feeding later discussions among this expert group. So then the sixth good practice was to complement planning products with an implementation strategy. And as I already said, this part of our project was very carefully done and much attention was paid to it. And actually the implementation strategy was seen as to be the utmost product of the whole project to the extent that the actual prioritization analysis was only small, one small part of it. So the implementation strategy that was published in the Tavoitteet Teoksi publication, it included a description of a collaborative model for TRB management in general, where the state of Finland was considered as a landowner and cattle farmers were considered as land managers and TRB management was financed through agri-environmental subsidies. And all this was contract-based action. And also the implementation strategy dealt with the role of EU projects, with, which is constantly growing. So funding for TRB restoration, now if we have managed TRBs that are abandoned, then the ecological succession uh, takes charge. And if we want to um, reinitiate management on those sites, often restoration actions are needed. And funding for these restorative actions are often coming from EU projects. Also, this project revealed that we really need coordination of TRB management on a national scale. And that also could be EU funded, perhaps. And one very important finding was that we need timely, accurate data on TRP management situation, but also on the ecological attributes of TRP. So the species information and the habitat information, habitat quality information is totally lacking in, in a spatial format. And all these um, data sets should be available in one national GIS database. And luckily in Finland, we have this SACTI system, which has the spatial data on protected areas, and it is um, targeted to reasonably small spatial units. So it is like a habitat patch level data, and it, it contains information from conservation areas, but also all survey TRBs are included in the SACTI system. So also privately owned survey TRBs are in SACTI, and this is like a jackpot <laughs> for TRB conservation, that we have such a good GIS data infrastructure here in Finland. And then the implement implementation strategy uh, touched upon the principles of adaptive co-management and adaptive governance, which I will explain a bit later. Those were like the basic principles behind how effective and cost efficient TRB management could be arranged in Finland. Then the seventh good practice was to promote mainstreaming and enabling. And actually, in recent years, there has been an increasing awareness on the conservation value of TRBs, and, and with collaboration, I and my colleagues have contributed to this discussions with providing recent accounts and, and research-based information. And the implementation strategy publication actually is one very good example of this kind of mainstreaming and translating into words kind of work. 
then the popularization work is, is very crucial in order to raise marginal conservation topics into public awareness. And that is the situation of GRB conservation. So the Finnish conservation discussions have very much focused on forest conservation and Meyer conservation. But GRBs have sort of been like, like weird habitat in, in that sense. So I have tried my best on my behalf to do that. It has taken a lot of effort, but I have written a lot of blog posts out of the issue. So how to organize management of, of the general biotopes so that um, species threatenment can be stopped. I also participated in, in a national science popularization project where I wrote an article together with journalists in order to show how um, the rural landscape has been changing and what that really means for livelihoods and for biodiversity. Also some more opinion type pieces have come out in my blog. And then also the WWF has taken on to the issue of TRB conservation through the like consumer guidance type of work. So they published this meat guide, so liha opas, for consumers to inform them what types of meat they could buy and still live a sustainable life. And, and this meat guide took a clear stance on TRBs and, and it clearly states that although other types of meat are a bit questionable, TRB meat is good. And then the last writing that I have published in my uh, Perine Biotopi or TRB blog is, is a a rough calculation on how many domestic animals we really would need to manage all Finnish TRB sites. And I will reveal that, that the figure is, the number is surprisingly low. There was some Twitter mayhem going on on this topic. So what about the big picture of conservation of traditional biotopes today? And, and I must say that it seems much better than 10 years ago. So a lot of happened, a lot has happened in, in the recent years. And much of this good happening is because of the Helmi Habitats program. So Helmi Habitats program is is a conservation program led by the Ministry of the Environment and it aims to strengthen Finland's biodiversity and safeguard the vital ecosystem services that nature provides for us. And at the same time, the program is working to curb climate change and promote adaptation to it. And there is a specific target in the Helmi program that is related to TRBs and it is that the Helmi program aims to rehabilitate 15,000 hectares of seminatula grassland biotopes by the end of 2023. And this does not um, target only meadow habitats, but also wood pastures are included. And the actions include restoration and management targeted to TRBs in the Natura 2000 network and other valuable sites and a national resurvey of GRBs, including fieldwork and GIS-based data handling. So uh, downloading the data into the SACTI database, basically. The program also includes TRB conservation plans using a collaborative approach and TRB management plans individually for each site. So site-specific management planning, which is very useful. So this is the current situation is very positive, I must say. And, and even the, the fact that the National Resurvey of TRBs has already been done or is nearly finished, it is a great leap forward in improving the level of knowledge on the current situation of TRB management and habitat quality and habitat distributions and so forth. So the current situation seems very promising. 
Then, back to the best practices of conservation planning. The eighth practice in, in the list of best practices was to establish social learning institutions to support tools and products. So the success of conservation initiatives depends on the ability of these initiatives to encourage and empower stakeholders to implement sustained conservation action. I have said this several times. And this means that we, we need uh, flexibility in our social systems around conservation. So adaptation of rules and norms that shape the interactions of, of people with others and with nature is crucial. And what does this mean in practice? This means that we need education and training. And in our case study, we did education and training of, of Metsähallitus staff. So we supported this knowledge and technique transform, transfer and, and networking among um, the staff members so they could have support from each other. And for example, this course that we are on now, this was originally established as part of, of a METSO second project that was run by Finnish Environmental Administration and funded by the Finnish um, Ministry of the Environment. So this is social learning that we are doing here at the moment. Also, up-to-date information needs to be applied in conservation planning and thus we really need to achieve that up-to-date information. And the Helmi Habitats program now is a huge step or even a huge leap forward in that sense so that we can get up-to-date information on GRPs. SACTI database is here very important because if, if the data is left on those papers <laughs> that are filled in field. So then it does not end up in a usable format as we have discussed uh, when speaking about data inputs for zonation. So uh, in order for us to use that information that is collected from field, it has to be translated into a digital format and into a usable format. Then we need meetings and discussions among practitioners and academics and in the case of of TRP conservation for example perine elo functions as, as such but there are subgroups under the Finnish board on ecological restoration for other habitat types also for forests and myers and so forth these are actually very important working groups then it is important to participate in adaptive management processes to deliver effective conservation action in the long term. And what does this mean? So the need for adaptive management or adaptive co-management and adaptive governance means that there is a need to integrate the social sciences more effectively into conservation planning theory and practice. And I will emphasize here the practice side. And this is actually a rather conceptual framework that is based on, on the social ecological systems theory and concepts of adaptive management, co-management and adaptive co-management. Adaptive management means an approach to natural resource management that emphasizes learning by doing through management where knowledge is incomplete yet actions are needed very true in the context of conservation. Then co-management is a process of joint or shared decision making, conflict resolution or management. This is like a social sciences approach and this also is very crucial in the context of conservation. And when we put these two uh, approaches together we get adaptive co-management which basically is joint management by several social actions actors through learning by doing in a collaborative way. So adaptive co-management is, is something that is, is continually done 
when you don't have all the information that you need, but you need to anyway conduct some actions and you learn while you do those actions. And it is a cyclical process and, and in every cycle you get more information on, on the effectivity of the actions that you conduct and then you can refine um, the practices. Then adaptive governance refers to an adaptive institutional and policymaking context and collaboration between state and non-state actors. And this is very important for TRP conservation. So, because TRPs are so flexible in their ecological nature, and they are so dynamic as ecosystems and as habitats, um, they really need uh, a governance approach that is very reactive to those ecological changes that can occur quite quickly, actually. And, and because they are dependent on management that is usually done by non-state actors, those actors need to be included in the decision making and policy making context and processes. So collaboration is needed. It is, it is key to success. And these can be realized in, in adopting participatory planning practices, for example. So one specific example of this kind of participatory process, collaborative long-term conservation effort that has produced, produced successful outcomes, both in ecological and social terms, is the TRB management that is done in the Southwestern Finland Archipelago National Park. And here these photographs are taken from the island of Jungfrusär, which is is the TRB hotspot in Finland, a very wonderful place. Visit if you can. So here in, in for example, on, on Jungfrusar, Metsähallitus Parks and Wildlife Finland functions as the coordinator because the island is part of the national park and in Finland national parks are on state-owned land and this Metsähallitus is, is the representative of the landowner. But then uh, on this state-owned land, grazing and other management activities have been organized. And these include management contracts with non-governmental uh, actors, typically cattle farmers, to organize the grazing in summertime. So the farmers bring sheep and other um, grazers to the islands for the summertime and, and when the grazing season ends, they will take the animals back into to the farms. And also this grazing activity is, is complemented with voluntary mowing and raking work that is done by NGOs and private citizens who voluntarily come and attend these occasions. For example, there is a figure on or picture of spring raking at Jungfrusar. So this is the WWF camp that was organized in May 2018. So there are quite a lot of people involved and, and a very fruitful collaboration that is, is flexible and very effective. And the funding primarily comes from the agri-environmental scheme, but also, of course, because Metsähallitus um, Parks and Wildlife Finland is the coordinator, also the national funding is of importance here. And of course, the VVF um, work input is, is paid by them. So the funding in this case is not dependent on a single funding source, and that is a good thing. All right, it has really been very heartwarming to me to see how people are appreciating TRB management and how many are willing to contribute to TRB conservation voluntarily. And one such a success story is the Sefert Weeks in national parks. And I wanted to end this lecture with, with this success story. 
So it started from 2016 when Metsähallitus Parks and Wildlife Finland opened the call for voluntary shepherds that look after summer grazes on TRB sites within several national within several national parks in Finland. And one year later, a record number of applications was achieved. So there were a total of 4,767 applications for 142 herding weeks. So the voluntary subherders needed to be like, there was a lottery going on. So not everyone got <laughs> their separate week, but it was random who got it, who won it. And this has been a very successful uh, practice and it was um, suggested that it would get the award for the best European landscape project. Well, it did not get the main award, but it was acknowledged in the competition. And the situation now this year is that, that this popularity is growing. So this year Metsähallitus Parks and Wildlife Finland received over 14,000 applications for the Shepherd Weeks for next summer. And they have increased the number of sites because the uh, demand is so huge. So this has proven to be a very successful, innovative way to organize TRB management, even on those sites that are very remote and otherwise would be very hard to organize management to. And I hope that this development will continue and also the private land owners, private farmers perhaps could take inspiration from this Metsähallitus practice. And of course, the biodiversity benefits of this kind of, of practice is, is significant and the social impact is huge. It supports TRP conservation in a very beneficial way from multiple perspectives. So thank you for viewing and listening to this chatting and congratulations to you if you have now watched all video lectures of our course and I hope you have enjoyed.